Red's cleavage has been filled in rather badly by a cheap marker. Hello and welcome to my review of The Unquiet Grave by Peter J. Evans. This 2004 effort was part of a series of books from Rebellion, owners of the famed UK comic 2000 AD and Games Workshop's publishing label Black Flame, an attempt to branch out and either milk the long tail of the loyal 2000 AD fan base or an attempt to draw new fans to the comic that has been on tick over for quite a few years now. The Durham Red series ran to five novels. There was a three novel series featuring Judge Anderson, a handful of Judge Dredd books, and one with the original strontium dog, Johnny Alpha. Evans was, if memory serves, 2080's editor at the time these novels came out, and his writing outside of this series is limited to one original novel and a couple of Stargate tie-ins. For those not in the know, Durham Red was one of the original Strontium Dogs, mutants from a radiation-polluted future who could only find work as bounty hunters, also known as search destroy agents. She featured regularly alongside Johnny Alpha and in one or two series where she took the, took the lead. Her particular mutation made her a vampire for all intents and purposes, and she was reviled by her own kind who were themselves reviled by the unmutated. Eventually, Red decided that she'd had enough of the Strontium Dog search-destroy lifestyle, and she signed up to be cryogenically frozen for a few years. But a malfunction in the system meant that she woke up more than a thousand years later in a world where the mutants and the unmutated are in total war across the entire galaxy, and the mutants fight in her name, hailing her a religious icon called Saint Scarlet. The human society, ruled by religious zealotry, consider her the ultimate blasphemy, However, when she wakes up into this grim carnage, both sides recognise her as less than her reputation has built her up to, and both sides prefer to carry on the war anyway. This is a war where planets are routinely raised to the ground. This story begins a few months after those events which are recounted in the graphic novels The Scarlet Cantos and The Vermin Stars. Red, disillusioned by the state of the galaxy, has decided to seek some old-fashioned pleasures and in the process disappeared. Her two companions, Godolkin, a former soldier she sent away, and he's seeking answers at a remote monastery. Her other companion, the mutant Judas Harrow, has been looking for her and tracked her down to a cult on another planet. The cultists are keeping Red in a drug stupor and are harvesting her blood for their own pleasures. After a firefight, Harrow and Red escape. Red decides that she wants to return to the first planet she saw after she was unfrozen. This planet was destroyed by the mutants and virtually nothing has been left alive. She finds nothing of interest there and drifts along convalescing rather aimlessly. Meanwhile, Godolkin discovers some interesting archaeological finds from Red's original time and messages them to come to the monastery. When they arrive, they are immediately suspicious of the Ava and discover that Godolkin has then left. They explore the monastery and are attacked. Red finds and rescues Godolkin and discovers in the process that the monks are harvesting brains to feed to a giant monster living in the planet. Red discovers that the planet was in fact the moon, which some 200 years after she froze herself was the object of an experiment to see if they could move whole planets. However, travelling to a different dimension, the moon crew found instead a brain-eating monster. Some 800 years later, the monster is ready to wake a heavy sleeper, perhaps, and wreak havoc on the galaxy. To complicate matters further, there is an iconoclast and unmutated but genetically and biomechanically altered human, a special agent on the planet. Initially opposed to Red's existence, the two fight, but then they don't, for reasons. The agent is investigating the disappearance of another agent and has called in backup, so there are more humans coming, there are cultists to fight off, and a giant monster from a different dimension to kill, all in a day's work for Red, one assumes. The story is what you might call something of a mixed bag, if you'll forgive the cliché. The pace is generally good, labouring only briefly during Red's convalescence after her rescue. In the final act, the time pressure of the brain-eating monster waking up could be utilised better, but it's more the decisions that are made by certain characters, combined with some instances of plot armour, that hamper the story, really. If you're unfamiliar with Red's story from 2000 AD, the various recaps and lapses into exposition aren't so laborious and are handled well enough so, so as to not drag things to a complete halt. 
If you are familiar with Red's story, then the similarity between it and Warhammer 40k with religious zealots in both engaging in a galaxy-wide total war with anything deviating from the norm or engaging in anything that looks like cult-like behaviour, that will probably be familiar to you. The examination of human hypocrisy inherent in the hatred of anything mutated juxtaposed with the embracing of every other kind of human augmentation, be it cybernetic, narcotic or genetic, is the sort of thing that 2000 AD did really well, especially when their writers were plundering the golden age of sci-fi rather than their own back catalogues. Red's own position is quite interesting in that regard as well. Her, her image is revered, but her actual existence is mostly irrelevant. Both sides know the truth, but would prefer to continue with their war rather than acknowledge the falsehoods that underpin it. A truly dark universe reflecting a truly dark view of humanity. 2000 AD fans would have seen this before, of course, as only difference in aesthetics between it and the basics of the story Rogue Trooper. The debt owed to Warhammer and Games Workshop is more significant than that owed to other creditors such as Frank Herbert, whose mentats appear here, as does Lovecraft's love of tentacled mad or dormant gods from other dimensions. However, the debt that is most significantly owed is to the 1997 movie Event Horizon. The moon is turned into a giant spacecraft by four large warp engines that take it to another undefined space, ludicrously hot, where it has picked up this brain beast, the psychic emanations of which turn the crew of the spaceship insane and they murder each other. Much of which is revealed to Red & Co when she discovers their corpses in and a video log. The entire planet shows up on scans as a life form. One crew member rips out his own eyes and declares, I don't need to see. The finale is much the same as well. The drives re-engage to take the ship back to its dimension and Red fighting against the countdown to make her own escape. It's certainly a curiosity to see a novel which has hypocrisy as one of its main themes, making such liberal use of somebody else's work. I'll stop short of calling it plagiarism, despite the mere seven years between the two projects, but I will say that if you're borrowing from all these other sources, then the onus is on you to make something that surpasses the original, and this is both too similar and not as good, before you factor in the unfortunate pairing of Red and Major Keter, the iconoclast secret agent. Twice they come together and are separated for no reason other than that Evans can't have them fighting forever without picking a winner, particularly the first time where Kerta seems to be enlisting Red's help but throws a tracker at her and then runs off. When Red follows the tracker to its destination, she is literally walking in Kerta's footsteps. Later, they're fighting on the same side, and Red, a vampire, remember, feeds on one of the victims. This would be the first time that the pious Keta has seen the true nature of Red, and the first time she truly saw her acting as the blasphemy she's made out to be, and Keta is visibly shaken by what she witnesses, but again, she chooses to run off rather than attempt to engage. Evans should have had the guts to kill off Keta, but clearly didn't have the will or the editorial freedom to do so, and it harms the credibility of his story on both occasions. Likewise, the insistence that humans considered the moon expendable is utter nonsense. Any planet with that sort of plan and the resources to carry it out would test their drive on a different asteroid or planet. Likewise, a galaxy willingly exterminating itself being presented as in real trouble if the brain bug gets free just doesn't ring true. Unfortunately, Evans' handling of his lead, Durham Red, isn't great either. She was always the psychic, the foil or the antagonist in her early 2000 AD appearances. She worked far better in a less is more sort of way. There was an unpredictability, a bubbling current of danger around her all the time. As the lead, getting inside her head as we do, that mystery is lost. The story is at its absolute best when Harrow is working to rescue her in the early stages and that section even ends with her losing control and attacking him. It promises a great deal that the rest of the book doesn't live up to and it's partly because Red is quite charisma free. Her attempts at wisecracking are dismal and totally at odds with her position as the cause of a galaxy spanning genocide. She should have had the weight of a thousand worlds on her shoulders, but rarely does that show, and then not very well. Instead, she's cursed with the horrible weight of a thousand Whedonisms, both a reminder that Evans can't do humour, and that better vampire media does exist somewhere in the galaxy. I smell blood. Are you sure? She glared at him incredulously and pointed to her fangs. Uh, 
vampire and that's not a question either so the punctuation here is clearly just there to mimic that valley girl attitude even though the mutant ghetto of Milton Keynes is rather a long way from California by every metric you can consider. Here's some more of them and none of them are good. Landing on the low gravity world of Lavinus, Red Quips, Snack, talk about a weight loss program, Later, note to self, never ever go anywhere without a gun. Sensible is for wimps. Note to self, never ever trust an iconoclast. It's not that I don't trust you, I just don't trust you. She yawned mightily. Wake me up in about 1200 years. Funny you should say that. Well, no, not really. But that's not to say that the unquiet grave doesn't have some amusing parts. Good old kin, he wonders why the abbot is so keen to engage with him in conversation, and the abbot tells him that all the other monks have taken a vow of silence. Anne Evans, after describing the various murders and mutilations the moon crews have performed on each other, writes, whatever murderous successes the ill-fated occupants of this place had committed, at least none of them had taken the manual out of the ops room. A particularly effective piece of dry humour in this grim depiction of the future, the novel could have done with a little more of this and a little less wisecracks because despite Red's many attempts to be funny, her involvement in this book's few moments of real humour is minor at best. Why does she say snack, by the way? I assumed that it was an alternative to swearing in media aimed at young audiences such as comic book readers, but the gore here would certainly make this unsuitable for them anyway. But if it's a swearing analogue, why does Red swear as well when she says it? Shit, Red hissed. Snacking, 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 shit. We are going to be down here a really long snacking time. Now switch the pissing light off, okay? And doesn't the second one read better like this anyway? And if Red is starting to look just a little bit difficult to like, then it's because you haven't considered the true extent of her idiocy. On her arrival at Lavinus, a monastery, Harrow suggests that she changes into something slightly more demure in order to better hide her identity. She refuses and naturally she draws the attention of the suspicious abbot. A nonsense line when you consider that he already knows who she is and has arranged much of the novel's plot strictly to bring her to Lavinus. She later bemoans her lack of any sensible shoes twice. Later, as the chaos is breaking out all around the planet, she sends Godolkin away and investigates the ship alone, despite knowing that the cultists and their brain-sucking god are using that ship as their temple. Struggling through a number of seized doors, she bemoans the absence of Godolkin's supersized muscles twice. Later, after being trapped underground with Antonia, the iconoclast ship's captain, they too separate and Red says step one of her plan is to put the power on, suggesting that planning an escape from the ship slash temple would be complicating things. However, her plan is never mentioned again. The truth of it, of course, is that there never was a step two or even a plan. There was just an excuse for Red to run off and get into another scrape. Red's biggest trouble is that her reputation is huge, but she herself is a dust moat in a disinterested galaxy. She can't have any effect on the wider galaxy, and so she has no story. At least with the SD agency, there would be a clear mission, some obvious end goal. Here, with the scale of the conflict on show, she can't ever achieve anything meaningful. Evans should have written this novel from Harrow's perspective, as he does at the start, before switching the focus to Red. Though nominally a mutant, Harrow is the everyman that is far more relatable. His morals are clear. His position as a thrall makes his motivation obvious as well. By keeping the focus on him, Red's unconvincing mental state and motivations could be kept hidden and an air of mystery established. Harrow disappears after his early heroics, though, and Belly does anything at all afterwards. It's a real shame. In terms of writing style, it isn't easy to see what Evans was going for. Things are generally written to be accessible to readers far younger than you'd actually want to, to be reading a novel that is so obsessed with gore and bodily fluids. But who does actually read 2000 AD these days? Is it the same old men that were reading in the 1980s heyday? Or is it their children? Evans can write decently, and there are parts here and there where he demonstrates that quite nicely, but there are also parts that are quite perfunctory or cheesy as well. This explosion on page 24 is a good example of the good, the bad, and the gory. Harrow had to dive back into the doorway again as a searing column of white-hot flames spat along the corridor towards him. The noise was amazing. 
He risked a glance back outside. The service lock was a roiling smokeshot inferno. Things moved fitfully amid the flames, but not for long. It must have simply been the effects of heat on flesh, scorched tissue twisting away from blackening bone. Nothing could have survived the blast. The words here in this first sentence convey a good sense of pace and motion and action, as well as the violence of the explosion. This alliteration at the end also creates a sense of the power unnaturally ravaging flesh. Unfortunately, this fixation on destroying human bodies and describing the resultant gore will become a bit excessive going forward. But here, we're still in the first act. It might grow to be a touch tiresome, but it really isn't this early on. But then we have this bit in the middle. Why would you write so lyrically about the visual aspects of this, but then describe the noise as amazing and nothing else? I just don't understand that. Later, when Red barges into Antonia, the vampire hit her hard, bowling her over, swiping her sideways with a metal bar still chained to her arms. The impact was amazing, the pain sudden and incredible. At least here we get a little bit more, but I'm still not keen on this, it seems lazy. And if the ex explosion is roiling, then the surface of the planet Mundus roiled and swarmed. During her first fight with Keta, we get this. The marble floor hit her in the back and she slid, fetching up hard against a pillar. Red dived aside, heard the pod skitter past her and fetch up in this pile of soil. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's not going to happen. It starts to feel like the novel simply wasn't ready to be released. The repetition that this is just a part of and the higher than average number of typing errors that exist both point to that. Johnny Alpha and his sidekick Wolf Sternhammer still had mileage left in the tank when they were unceremoniously killed off. Red herself has been transplanted into this new millennium, a place where she is the most important figure and at the same time powerless, listless and purposeless. It's a strange place to position any kind of hero. Overall, The Unquiet Grave starts really well. It lags for a touch but always moves along fairly briskly. It will probably never bore you, but it's hard to say who would really enjoy it either. Evan seems to parcel out his effort rather than sustain it and suffers badly from an awkward and hard to warm to heroine. Sadly, Harrow proves himself to be a fairly decent leading man and Evans then completely underutilizes him, eschewing him from large parts of the plot altogether in order to focus on his three leading ladies. The first novel in the series would have done well to kill off one of that triumvirate of strong females and by doing so inject the idea that in this enormous and vicious conflict there is actually some genuine peril. It's also an indication that the whole conflict is just too vast for the characters moving in it that the brain bug plot takes over and the human mutant war is relegated to fleeting mentions. It's almost as if the very writers of it don't know what to do with something so incomprehensibly large. Rogue Trooper had at least his hunt for the commander that betrayed him, his mission to restore his biochip comrades to their physical form. Red has nothing. She chose to freeze herself. Bad luck brought her to this state and into a conflict that is too huge. If entire planets are routinely raised with fire, what impact can one person have? Particularly if both sides are as awful as each other. In this instance, it raises the question, how would it be worse if the brain bug got out and killed everybody quickly when they're intent on exterminating each other as quickly as they can anyway? The Unquiet Grave is notable mostly for being derivative of other sci-fi media and lesser than each of its parts. Not a disaster by any means, but hard to recommend anyway. I assumed that my copy of this book, being an ex-library book, had offended a censorious librarian somewhere down the line, and he or she had taken things into her own hands because you can clearly see that Red's cleavage has been filled in rather badly by a cheap marker. But it actually turns out that all of the copies of this book look like that. And why on earth would you do that to a book you're marketing with the tag Mutant Vampire Total Babe Careful Boys She Bites with an exclamation mark no less? Isn't the titillation factor your whole marketing plan? None of the following novels suffered such censorship. So were sales of this one bad enough that they hoped the later usage of boobs would help? Or did they just give up trying to get librarians to stock these? However, just like in the Judge Anderson book that I reviewed, the cover image was also the cover of an issue of 2080 back in the 1990s that was repurposed for the book. And it was censored back then as well. 
I don't know what's more embarrassing, really, the Puritanism or that god-awful tagline. I was keen to make sure that the artist got paid for this both times it was used, but then I stumbled across something else. And the only person involved in the whole project who definitely does deserve to get paid is Angelina Jolie. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.